All righty. We're going to start talking about design. And this is not my area. So I don't know what I'm talking about. Design. There's scenic design, costume design, lighting design. There's also sound design, but I'm not going to talk about that. The first thing I want to talk about are the objectives of the scene designer. We're talking about scene design first. The objectives of the scene designer or scenic design. The objectives of the scene designer. One, to create an environment for the performance. In other words, the scene designer builds the, it's, it's the setting, the environment. Where is this play taking place? The scene designer creates that environment. Two, set mood and style. When I go to a play and I look at the setting, and usually when you first walk in you see the setting, so set mood and style. Okay, I'll get out of your way in a minute. Set mood and style. Um, when you look at the set, you should be able to tell if the play is realistic or whether it's a non-realistic play, whether it's a musical, by what the set looks like. The set design should tell us that. And mood, is, it a, is, it this, or is this going to be a sad play, a happy play? Is it a comedy? Is it a drama? Is it a tragedy? If it's a tragedy, what will the color schemes tend to be? Darker. If it's a musical and it's a, it's a happy musical, musical comedy, what was it going to be? Very bright, very light. And we should know that when we see the set design. Three, distinguish realistic from non-realistic. This is tied into to the first two. Of course, all these tie together. But I should know from, from the moment I see the set, is this a realistic play or is it something else? Are we going somewhere else? Is it non-realistic? Is it absurdist? or whatever genre it might, we might be talking about. Um, I saw a very interesting play a number of years ago. It was, um, it was a, written by a, a, a man, and I forgot what South American country he was from, but the play was about um, a uh, praying mantis. And the characters were all human. But the set, from the moment I saw it, there was a, instead of having a, a clock on the wall of this house where the play took place, instead of it being a realistic clock, the clock looked like it had melted. And it was like hanging, like goo. And as soon as I saw that clock, I went, that. That's, that's not real. And the doors weren't shaped in a rectangular. The door was shaped almost like in a V. And I realized later it was shaped that way because if the character had wings, the top part was bigger than the top to make room for the wings to get through. Literally, it was about a praying mantis. And even though they looked human, they were talking about bugs. And what the story was, was this praying mantis, the female, wanted to mate with this male and then was going to eat him. And that was the story. And it was really strange. It was fun, but it was strange. Establish locale and period. By period, we're talking about time period, locale, where is this taking place? 
I directed a, a Shakespearean play a few years ago and uh, it's called Comedy of Errors and we decided to set the play instead of setting it in Italy where it was originally written for um, we set it in New Orleans and it was modern it took place in modern times as opposed to in the 1500s and the set designer did a wonderful job of going back and the whole set the front of the set looked like Bourbon Street I mean she, she copied if you went down to New Orleans and went down the one part of Bourbon Street it was exact and anybody who'd ever been there immediately went that's New Orleans so capturing the locale and then the period uh, you know if it's a futuristic thing if it takes place in the past we want to know by when we look at the set does the set help tell us that one of the most important objectives of the scene designer is to bring the director's concept to life remember we talked about directing we talked about a director having a concept this is how I see the play being done so when I went into the production meeting with with uh, that comedy of errors I said I'd like to do it as though it were taking place in New Orleans and it's the the scene designers job to bring that concept to life make that work find a way to make that work I did a production of the Scottish play here a few years ago and I wanted to do it futuristically as though it were in a, uh, a post-apocalyptic <coughs> production I wanted it to, to be to look like science fiction in many ways and I had a, my designer on that one had a hard time she had a hard time imagining what my concept was and we ended up it was confusing to the audience because what she basically designed was a a building or a shape that looked a lot like um, after 9-11 what was left of the of the towers now yeah that was post something destruction but I didn't want to go really go there but it was the the designer went there that's what she wanted to do um, so try to bring the concept to life next coordinate scenery with other design elements the other design elements is refer referring to lights and costumes coordinate the scenery with the other design elements in other words they have to mesh together they have to have to work together to create the design for the show I'll never forget this when I was in graduate school um, we had a designer there he was a wonderful man his name was Andreas Nomakos and Andreas um, was from Greece and what I loved about Andreas was um, he had, had, had been around in theater for a long time and he had a lot of great stories and Andreas had been in Greece when Germany invaded and took over Greece and he worked in a theater uh, in Greece and the Germans soldiers would come to the plays and what they didn't know was they were putting messages in the plays to send out to the underground and if they'd been caught they would have all been killed and sometimes it was stuff in his designs he'd put little signals paint them into the design so that the people would pick up on information they were supposed to get for sabotage against the Germans and they were doing it with the Germans sitting there in the theater watching the plays uh, and uh, Andreas told a lot of stories about that well he became famous uh, he designed theater and operas all over the world uh, in fact you can pick up a lot of textbooks that will show pictures from great operas and it'll be designed by Andreas Nomikos um, but I laughed at him we, they were doing an opera um, they were doing the opera Camille uh, at uh, my graduate school 
and Andreas uh, designed the set and it got to a point in the play where Camille comes out for the first time and Camille's supposed to be kind of a loose woman and the lighting designer on her entrance had this red light come up on, on Camille and when the red light came up the whole set turned bright red because it was such a, a, a bright red light and I'll never forget this Andreas Nomoko standing up and looked at the designer and went if I wanted my set to be red I would have painted it red <laughs> and they got into a huge fight <laughs> and Andreas won <laughs> and they changed the color of the lights because they were not coordinating <laughs> they were not working together and they should have been. Coordinate scenery with the other design elements. And finally, the last objective of a scene designer is to solve practical design problems. To solve practical design problems. What that means, uh, where are the entrances and exits going to be placed? That could be a design problem. For example, you guys just saw um, Blythe Spirit. We had to worry about where are the special effects at the end of the play going to be. Because we didn't want like books flying out and hitting Charles. Or did we? I don't know. <laughs> but we don't want the actor hurt. That's a design problem. Where is this going to happen? Let's fix that. Let's make that work for the show. Uh, a number of years ago, we did Medea here. You guys saw Medea at the beginning of the semester. We did Medea here uh, at ETSU out at the amphitheater, for you guys that want to go out there. And um, we had, uh, I'll never forget this, we had a, a burning fire. We actually had fires out there. And we had these big pots with fires in them. And that became a design problem because it got windy during the production and the flames were like going all over the place. And at one point we were worried about one of the soldiers capes getting caught on fire. And w that was a design problem. We had to deal with that. Uh, we also had fireworks going off at one point. And we had to make sure that uh, it was magic. Medea went like this and two pots exploded into the air to show her magic. And I have to say this, that design problem was never fixed. They never went off when they were supposed to. She'd go like that, and then five minutes later, it'd go <laughs> in the middle of another scene. Up. Yeah, she was warm. <laughs> it will go. OK. Let's go to the next slide. A very important person that you need to know is Robert Edmund Jones. Robert, Robert Edmund Jones was born in 1887 and he died in 1954. This sounds like a test question. He is the most outstanding American scene designer of the 20th century the most outstanding American scene designer of the 20th century. He was not from Pittsburgh. If you were seeing plays in the early part of the 20th century up until the time he died, Almost every Broadway show, a lot of them, would have been designed by Robert Edmund Jones. Um, his style is referred to as simplified realism. He was known for his vivid use of color and simple but dramatic lighting.
And that's what he looked like. That's Robert Edmund Jones. Let's go to the next slide. This is one of his scene designs. This is for a production of Hamlet that he did. It's very simple, but the lights, the way they came down through this, from what I understand of it, really were dramatic. And go to the next slide. This is another one of his scene designs. This is a drawing of his, of his production of Richard III that he designed. But he's very important, and I would know that he is the most outstanding American scene designer of the 20th century. The process of the scene designer. This is how does a scene designer work? In the beginning, the scene designer gets hired and meets with the director. And that is referred to as the production meeting. It's where the director and the designer gets together. All the designers are at that meeting. They talk about concept. And the designers start to throw out some ideas of things they think about the play. I've heard designers refer to this as the research period. The research period. They read the play. They read the play a lot. And they look at what the play needs. What might it need? When they meet with the director, they find out things like time period, we want to set it, what does, do you think the play means, all that. They tie that in with their research. And then they go away for a while. And then there's another production meeting. And at that production meeting, the designer comes in and shows a model. A model is usually a quarter inch or half inch scale and they build out of cardboard or some, some something they can build with construction paper usually it's cardboard and they build a small model of what the set's going to look like at first it's not painted it's just white the director will look at that model make suggestions, changes, and then the designer will continue on. They'll paint the model, and they'll do what are called renderings. Renderings are drawings of the set. On the renderings, they really play with the colors, the textures, the shape of the set. What's it going to look like? What kind of um, uh, textures is it going to have put on it to make it look like whatever it's going to be? The designer also creates what's called a ground plan, sometimes called a floor plan. The ground plan or floor plan is as though you came over top the stage and you're looking down on it. And it shows where everything's going to be. I'm going to give you some examples here in a moment. I'll show you some. The floor plan or ground plan helps the director then to block the show by looking at what the stage is going to look like from above. They can then picture where our actor is going to be on that stage. Where do I need to have this scene take place? Ground plan. Finally, the designer creates working drawings. The working drawings are the plans on how everything's going to be built. Those plans will be handed over to a person called the technical director. And the technical director will work with the people in the shop to get all the stuff built. But they'll build everything using the working drawings provided by the designer. It will be the designer's job to do that. Some of the things that they may use to build a set with we 
We call them flats. But what a flat is, can anybody tell me? What's a flat? Anybody know? Yes, ma'am. Well, no, you're, uh, what you're referring to, I believe, would be if we decided we were going to have platforms. Flats are the walls. And flats will be joined together, there'll be a series of them. And whatever the scenery is going to be is painted on it. There are different kinds of flats depending on the kind of material they're made out of. Some flats are called soft flats, which they're covered with muslin. It's a wooden frame, a wooden frame, and it's covered with muslin, and then you paint on the muslin. <coughs> Is that yours? Yes. Did I knock that down? No, I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. So, a flat. You take some one by, one by four usually, and you make a frame. I'm not going to go into all the stagecraft, but they have corner blocks that they put it together with. And sometimes they have keystones, which means if there's two, you join them with a keystone. Keystone. I'm not going to ask you about corner blocks and keystones. This is not stagecraft. That's what the back of a flat would look like. And then the front would be muslin. Or there are hard flats. Hard flats use uh, either uh, quarter inch plywood or. Um, some other wood product, again, making it hard so that it actually is a wall. The, f the flats that you saw in Blythe Spirit were hard, flat, hard covered flats. And that makes them a little more sturdy than if you cover them with muslin. In the old days, they covered everything with muslin. But if I were the scene designer, I would show in my working drawings, how many flats do I need? What size do they need to be? They would be drawn to scale, and then the people in the shop could look at that and know exactly how to build the set. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's look at some examples here. Go ahead, Juan. This is a model of the play Moon for the Misbegotten, and I'm going to talk about Ming Chao Li here in just a moment. He's a pretty famous and, and very important scene designer. Does that look real? Moon for the Misbegotten is a pretty realistic play, and that, my friends, is a little tiny model. But the detail in it is so clear, we can see exactly what the set's going to look like. So that's a painted model. It would start out, it would have been just white, and then he paints it in. He paints in the pieces. Sometimes on models, you'll, they'll, uh, it's fun when you go to production meetings, they'll bring out like little, little cutouts of little characters to scale and they'll put them on the set to show you what they're going to look like on the set. How big it's going to be compared to the people. Okay, that's a model by Ming Chao Li. Let's, let's, what's next? This is a rendering. This is a different play called Death Trap. And again, I want it to look the way the set's going to look. It's painted. You'll see that there's a cutout here 
that they put on it to show you how big everything is in comparison when an actor gets on it. But it should look like the inside of the set. It shouldn't be any different. Whatever this turn is, that's what the set's going to eventually look like. Let's see the next one. This is the ground plan or floor plan. And when I, when I um, am directing, I'll be given a copy of that so that I can imagine where people would be. But the squares are chairs, table, a bench. And then we show that there's stairs going up, up to another platform comes out over here we've got we've got some levels there's a door and that's all shown on the ground plan CL is the center line that's the center of the stage show you where everything's placed and that will be made so the director has something to work from okay next this is a working drawing and they're building stairs. So they're showing exactly how the stairs are going to be built with directions. I know you can't read this, but they put in the directions. Um, height will be, uh, and it goes right on down telling you exactly how you want it built. And they have to do a lot of these working drawings. Everything that's on the set has to have a working drawing so that the people know how to build it. I was working in a show, um, The Lost Colony. It's an outdoor drama in North Carolina. And I remember there, there was a, a big uh, dock in the show that they had to rebuild. It had gotten destroyed was getting rotten. It's an outdoor drama and it, had, it from the time it had been built it, it was getting rotten. And w they were rebuilding it but the designer wasn't there yet. And the, the guy that was the technical director was worried because the designer uh, was a union designer and he didn't like them rebuilding things there at the colony. What he would want is it be sent out to a union house and have union carpenters build it. And I remember uh, the, the, the technical director went to great pains because he didn't have time to send this thing out to have it rebuilt. And it was dangerous, it had to be replaced. So he rebuilt it and then aged it with paint to make it look like it was the old one. So when the guy got there he says, oh that thing's still holding up great after all these years. Looking good. <laughs> and uh, but we had the original drawings and they were following them exactly and then they aged it and put painting on it to make it look like it was 30 years old which I think it was supposed to have been at that time. Uh, so the working drawings. Questions about this? Make sense? Okay, let's go ahead. Ah, Ming Chao Li. He's very important. Ming Chao Li is called the Dean of Modern Scene Design. The Dean of Modern Scene Design. He was born in 1930 in China. He came to the United States with his family. And he began working in theater in the United States in the 1960s. He's referred to as the Dean, D-E-A-N, the Dean of American Theater Design because he's a college professor. He teaches at Yale University. He is considered right now probably the, the greatest scene designer in the world, living scene designer. He is designed on Broadway. He's won all kinds of awards for his designs. And he does design for theaters all over the world, both for uh, opera and 
for theater. He worked for Joseph Papp when he was at the uh, New York Shakespeare Festival. Uh, and he's just done lots and lots of great things and continues to do great things as well as teach. Today, almost every major scene designer at every university in the country somehow or another has studied from him or one of his students. In fact, our designer here, um, one of our designers here, uh, Dr. Delbert Hall, uh, has taken classes from Ming Chao Li and uh, certainly has learned a lot from him. Uh, he's a great, great scene designer. What's the next picture? I think I got something else here. Okay. That's it for that. Any questions about scenic design? Well, let's move on, and we're going to talk about costume design. Scene design, going back just for a minute, has been with us pretty much since the beginnings of theater. Um, there's hardly a time period uh, since the ancient Greeks where there wasn't some sort of setting, some sort of, of theater that they performed in and some sort of setting on the theater. Costume design, on the other hand, uh, though actors have worn costumes since the beginning of time, there was not a costume designer, per se. Not until, uh, really, the beginnings of the 20th century, um, when George II, Duke of Saxe-Meiningen, created the Meiningen Players and they begin to have a costume designer. Up until that time, actors just wore whatever they had. And every actor was pretty much responsible for his or her costume. All right. The objectives of the costume designer. Some of these are, are similar to the uh, set designer. One, establish the style of the production. Again, is it realistic or non-realistic? By what we're wearing, we, can, we should be able to tell that. Two, indicate the historical period. When is it taking place? Three, I think this is one of the most important. Show relationships. Show relationships. Let me go back to talking football or sports. How do we know who a player plays for when you go to a football game? Uniform. Their uniform. Each team has its own color or combination of colors. So here at um, ETSU, what are our school colors? Gold and blue, right? So if we have a game, if our basketball team is playing, they have a home jersey and an away jersey. Just in case the other team's colors are the same. So they'll have a gold jersey or white jersey, and then they'll have the blue jersey. And that way, when they go to another school, if the other school's wearing blue, they can wear the white or the gold. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we can tell the teams 
by what color jersey they're wearing, what color uniform they're wearing. Um, in football, I don't know so much in other sports, but in football, can you look at the players, with, not talking about the size of the players, but can you look at them and tell what position they play? How? No, not their size. Say it again. Their number. By what number a football player wears, you can tell what position they play or have a good idea what position they play. Quarterbacks tend to wear what numbers? Yeah, starting from 1 through 19. Quarterback is number one through 19. Kickers are also thrown in that, usually. Okay, what about linemen? What are their numbers? 60s, 70s. How about ends? 80s. You might not have known this. Running backs. 20s or 30s. Defensive um, um, linebackers. 50s. There's a reason for that. It helps the referees in case you're off sides or something. You're not playing where you're supposed to be. They can look at the number and be able to tell that. But it was done to help people when they first went to see the games to identify the players. And it, but, yeah. Well, now we have names on them except Notre Dame. Notre Dame is traditional. They don't have the names on the jerseys. But in the old days, that was the only way to judge was by the numbers. And even if I knew the names, I might not know what position they play if I'm looking at it really quick to decide if there's a, a lineman in the backfield. And he's not supposed to be. Okay, so what I'm getting at is showing relationships. If you go to a play, let's say Romeo and Juliet. In Romeo and Juliet, you have two families. The Capulets and the Montagues, and they hate one another. There are a lot of people in that play. What is a costume designer going to do to help you follow the play better? Absolutely right. The Capulets will be one color, the Montagues will be a different color. And Romeo and Juliet will be what? Probably the same color. The same color, but there'll be a mixture of the two families because they get married. They'll also, because they're the leads, probably be brighter. Their costumes will be more vibrant so that we can pick them out in a crowd. We'll see them. We'll know that that's Romeo and Juliet. So in a good production of Romeo and Juliet, it's, it shouldn't be hard to figure out who's with what family. Just by looking at the costumes, I understand relationship. They'll do that a lot in plays. Husbands and wives will have similar colors. Family members will have similar colors. People who are going to get together later, lovers, they'll put them in similar colors and when they get together they'll match. Sometimes it's subliminal. We're not supposed to pick up on it right away, but as we watch the play it starts to make sense. So do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. To show relationships. Um, you were bringing up something else over here too when you were talking about the servants 
costumes will be different from the from the ma the pe the rich people, the masters. That will show the relationship. Who is who's the king? The king is going to be different than somebody who's a servant. They're going to have a different kind of costume. It should do that. If it doesn't, the play is going to be in trouble in terms of costuming. Okay. Meet the needs of the performer. This is important. One of the things that has to happen with a costume designer, costume designer needs to know first from the director and then by interviewing the actors, what physical things are you going to do in the show? For example, in Blythe Spirit, remember when Elvira fell over the couch? She did the back flip over the couch. We had to let the costume designer know that right away. Because she physically had to flip over a couch and we wanted to make sure she had a dress that she could do that in. That's a, that's a, a need of the performer. I have to be able to do my choreography. And there was some talk at first she was going to have more of a Marilyn Monroe kind of dress that was tighter. And I couldn't see her doing the flip with a real tight dress. It had to be a loose dress. Okay? Um, some of the other characters in the show were the same way in terms of how we wanted to make sure. Uh, Madame Arcati flips off the, the thing and ends up with her legs straight up in the air. When she first, the first costume she got, she was revealing a lot more than we wanted to show the audience. Because the dress, when it went up, she wasn't wearing bloomers underneath. And it was like, oh my, <laughs> we have to fix that. We had talked about it. But the designer thought he had fixed it, but it didn't look right. Meet the needs of the performer. Other things that might affect that too are allergies. I, for example, am allergic to wool. I can wear wool, but I have to have something between the wool and my skin. If it touches my skin, I break out. I was working for a professional company in Oklahoma. They built me. They didn't buy it. They built me a suit, three-piece suit. When I got it at the, at the fitting, I went in and put it on and went, this is wool. And it's like up against my skin. And the designer went, oh, yes, and it's beautiful. And I went, but I will, I will break out. I will not, I'm going to have bumps all over me and I'm going to itch really bad. And she got mad at me. She said, you wear what I designed for you. And I went, well, when I first came in for a fitting, when you actors go in, you fill out a card. And one of the things you put on the card, if you're allergic to something. And I said, check my card. Allergic to wool. They had not read that. And she apologized to me and got me a new costume. That was their mistake. Again, meet the needs of the performer. They have to take all that into consideration. Be consistent with the other design elements. That goes without saying. It's the same thing we just talked about. The scene design can't be from one period and the costume design be from something else. They have to work together. They have to coordinate what they're going to do. Finally, indicate the nature of an individual. Indicate the nature of an individual. And they do this through three things. The character's station in life, their occupation, and personality. Station in life, are they the boss or are they the worker? Are they the king or are they the servant? Where are they in life? 
costumes should indicate this. When you look at them, the costume should tell the audience what this is. Where are they in life? What is their occupation? When I look at a costume, when I see a character, I should know that. Their occupation. And finally, and this I think is the most interesting of these, their personality. What's the personality of the character? Are they flamboyant? Are they reserved? What are they? Their personality. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you people ever people watch? Yeah, everybody does, right? You go to a restaurant, you go out here and you sit down somewhere and you watch people walk by. Do you ever make decisions about those people without knowing them by what they're wearing? Be honest. Yeah. How about over here? Yeah, I don't believe that at all. Yeah, we do. We judge people often before meeting them by what they wear. We label them. You see somebody, you go, jock, nerd, geek, hey, hippie, damn. <laughs> right? By what they wear, you make decisions. And don't we define ourselves by what we choose to wear? I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't, when they go out to buy clothes, I'll just take this. You choose your clothes. You define yourself by what you wear. And depending on what you're going to be doing, you'll change those clothes you'll choose the clothes to fit the occasion that you're going to be going to. If you're going to a job interview, you don't dress like this. It depends on what you're going to do that day. It depends on who you're going to meet, what you're going to try to say to that person by what you wear. Costumer has to take that into consideration. What's the personality of this character? We watch Cyrano de Bergerac. Cyrano if he came out dressed in all the ruffles and lace that all the other characters had, wouldn't be Cyrano. He's got to be plain. Count de Guiche can't come out dressed plain. He's got to have all the ruffles and lace and show his position. Does that make sense? I have been to plays where characters walk out and you go, uh-uh. They would not be wearing that. Because it defines them as something else than what they should be. I know it's stereotyping, but it's true. When we look at people they need to be dressed a certain way if they are a certain kind of character. Or we won't buy it. We won't believe it. Any thoughts or questions about that? Any discussion? That usually leads to a discussion. Somebody usually fights me on that one. I don't judge people by their clothing. Yeah, you do. We just saw a piano lesson. You could tell, that's, that one's greatly costumed. You can tell the personality of each one of those characters by what they're wearing. And their position in life. When the preacher comes out, you know exactly he's the preacher. <laughs> by that suit that he wears. Okay. 
Sometimes this, this occupation thing, station in life, that gets, that gets thrust upon us. Because if we go to work, they expect us to dress a certain way. It might not be our choice, but it's a job. We have to wear whatever they tell us to wear. I saw uh, my daughter uh, has gotten really into a kid's show that drives me crazy, but it's uh, um, about a little girl it's named Charlie. You know what I'm talking about? Good luck, Charlie. My, my daughter loves that show. And um, I, we, I did find this very funny. There's a character in there that works at a fast food place. And he came out the, in, the, in the scene she was watching the other day, and I, I did, I, I cracked up laughing. He came out wearing, the place is a chicken place, and he came out with his chicken shirt on. And she said, one of the other characters asked him, he says, why are you wearing that shirt? He says, well, all my other shirts are dirty. And then he puts on this chicken head, this hat with, looks like a big chicken head. And she's going, why are you wearing the hat? And he's going, well, I don't want to look silly. <laughs> it matched the shirt. So there's teenage guys walking around with a stiff chicken head on his hat. I don't want to look silly. That was the joke, but it tied into this. It made that work. All right, what am I doing? I'm going to do it on time. All right. Let me see the next picture. Okay. Um, one of the things that happens with costume design, the costume designer goes through a lot of the same things as the scene designer. There's the uh, period of research where you read the play and you start reading a lot about the, the time period and all those things. And then you meet with the director, and, the, and then you have, um, you start to present things to the director in, in the second or third meeting. And what uh, costume designers tend to do is they present renderings. At first, very simple ones, sometimes just sketches. But eventually, there'll be full drawn pictures of how they see the character going to be dressed. It'll have the colors in it. Any headpieces, whatever it might be that they're going to be wearing, that will be put into the rendering. And what I like about this picture, um, this Felicia Blue Rose, who designed Hello Dolly, there's the rendering, there's the finished product. Are they close? Color's a little different, but the, the, the dress pretty much is the same thing. Uh, you got the white gloves, the earrings are even in the picture, the whole thing, the dress, how it's, how it's made, all that ties. Start with the rendering. Now later renderings, at first it'll just be a picture. Then they'll do a more detailed rendering which is where this is getting to be. And a lot of times they'll put on the rendering swatches. A swatch. It's w A T C H. Swatches. Swatches are little about that big, about a couple inches by a couple inches squares of the material they plan to use. And they'll attach the swatches on the drawing. They'll staple them to it. And that way the director, when the director looks at these to decide if it's okay, not only has a picture, but now knows what the material is going to feel like, the texture of it, and also exactly what the material's color is going to be. Because again, the drawing is one thing, the dress is a little different. But the swatches will make up for that. Because that's the material they're going to cut the dress from when they build it. I think there's one more example of this. Let's, let's see another one. This is also from Hello Dolly. Different character. But again, we have the drawing, 
the rendering. Notes are written on it about what the character is going to have, what the materials are going to be, and then finally we get the actress in the costume. What's really great for designers now, I'm going to say this with the scene design, there are now computer programs that you can purchase and even though you can't draw very well, it'll put that figure up there and you can, on the computer program, completely design the thing. Which takes a lot of time out of drawing everything. It'll start with the initial look and then you just add clothes to it. Um, and man, that's, it's really changing. The, the, the computer designs are really changing the nature of of both scenic and costume and lighting designs because now we don't have to draw everything by hand. We can just put it into the program and the program will put it out there for us. So it's a lot of fun. Questions about this? Okay, next time we'll pick up from here and we'll continue to talk about design.